Numbers 22. And the children of Israel, excuse me, the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan by Jericho. And Balak the son, could you turn me down up here just a little bit? I, I appreciate it. I think I'm, really, I'm echoing up here in my own ears. There we go. All righty. And Balak the son of Zippor saw that all Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pithor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him. Saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Now come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Lord Jesus, we ask, God, that your hand will be upon the service. God, I pray that you'd give us a word from you, God. I pray, Lord, that you'd anoint me and help me to speak the words that you give to me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Greet your neighbor. You can have a seat. We've all been to places like a a luxury hotel or... theme park or some type of theater or something like that where we see the finished product of what has actually happened. You know, you go to uh, a theater, you see the play, uh, but you don't see all the people behind you, the curtains operating the the lights. I don't even know if they got the sandbag things anymore. It's probably all automated. Run the curtains back and forth. You don't even see the orchestra barely down inside the well, they've got all kinds of cool names for these. The Parthenon or whatever's going on. I don't know. The pit. There we go. The orchestra pit. You don't even see them guys, really. But you hear it, and you don't see what they're doing. Um, you know, tapestries are another good example. You see the front of a tapestry, and it's pretty. You see a nice picture. Um, but then you look behind it, and it's just nothing but strings. And you can't barely even make out what's going on back there. But stuff happens all the time that we don't know about, that we don't even think about. You know, I listen to a radio program every morning, um, and it's a three-hour-long program. And uh, but what I've heard is, for every hour that is on air, there's about two to three hours of preparation behind it. So this person could easily spend, you know, six, seven hours getting ready for a three-hour program. And it's just it's stuff like that. You don't understand. Stuff goes on all the time behind the scenes. So leading up to the story of Balaam. We all know Balaam is the guy that talked to the donkey and wasn't even stunned by it. Um, but leading up to this, the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. They had been in there for who knows how long, but the reason they were wandering around is because of unbelief. And there's just a series of events that unfold for the next, I think, probably about nine to ten chapters of them just wandering around. And a lot of it included them grumbling and complaining. They were being fed every day. Their clothes never wore out, yet it still wasn't good enough. They complained about the food. They complained about the accommodations. You know, they were tired of circling the same rock over and over again. Um, I think some scholars said that it would have took, uh, I think, maybe a little over a week to go the distance that they eventually covered, yet they wandered in circles for 40 years. And the purpose of this was God said, the people that doubted, they're not going to make it into the promised land. You see, God wanted to wipe out the Israelites right then and there. He told Moses right at the time they were about to take over the, the, um, the promised land. Remember, if you, if, if you do the, the, 12 deci- or, I'm sorry, the 12 spies, not the disciples, that's way ahead. Uh, but the 12 spies entered the land. They said, man, this place is huge. They got grapes as big as your fist. And, and, but the giants out there, they're, they're too big, and we're grasshoppers in their sight. And only Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that said, no, we can take this. And everyone else doubted. And the doubt made God so angry. He said, 
I want to wipe these people. He told Moses, he said, let's just start over fresh. Let's just get rid of them. And we'll start over and we'll have a stronger people. And Moses pled. He said, no, don't do it. And he said, if you do, the Egyptians and the people that we've already beat, they're going to mock you and they're going to say, what, is it? what of this great God? He can't even control his own people in so many words. And so God spared the children of Israel. But he said, not one of these people that doubted are going to enter into the promised land. I can't allow it. It can't happen. So he forced them to wander in this wilderness. But he still provided for them. He still took care of them. And... Along the way, they would just try to make it from one land to another, from one place to another. They'd ask permission from different people. Hey, you mind if uh, we cut through your land? We're not going to eat from your fields. We're not going to drink, you know, from your brooks. If we do, we'll pay for it. But that's all we, we just want to cut through. This is the shortest route. And many times, the people say no. And not only would they say no, they'd send out armies to go destroy them. But God was merciful, and God was with them, and they prevailed every time. They complained about just basically everything, <laughs> you know. And um, what, what I find funny about the children is how fickle they were. They would complain about not having food, but then they'd get thirsty, and then water would come from a rock, and they'd bust into a musical, and, and, and they would praise God for that. But then soon enough, they'd be complaining again, you know. It's, it's, you got to watch out whenever you're complaining, you know. You, you could be hindering the miracles that God has for you. You know, this, again, this was God's attempt and, and success at weeding out the doubters and the things um, that stopped the children of Israel as a whole from getting into the promised land. Anyways, the Bible says rejoice always. Rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. You see, God sent some of these obstacles for a reason. They didn't understand why they were being attacked just for simply wanting to go through. But God had a reason for this. So they tried to get through a couple lands, and instead of the landowners and the kingdoms saying no, they came out to utterly destroy them. But God gave them the victory despite this. You see, sometimes, and I want to point out this, that the Israelites, they may have won, but they weren't necessarily gaining ground. They were still wandering in the wilderness. So it wasn't like they had this huge victory and they're going forth and dividing and conquering and, and winning and getting all this footing. No, all they were doing was defending themselves. They were in, uh, uh, they were in defensive mode, basically. Um, and they were, you know, they, they were basically just surviving. That's what it is. They were, they were in survival mode. They were just trying to make it through, make it to the next day, make it to the next time manna fell. And, 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 and they really couldn't see an end in sight. They didn't know really what to do, you know. Sometimes you feel like you're on autopilot. Sometimes you feel like you're just maintaining what you're doing for God. But I want to encourage somebody tonight. If that's all that you can do, I want you to maintain what you're doing. You need to pray Every day, regardless if you feel it, you need to continue reading the Word of God, regardless if you understand. There's been many a times I've sat there and, and read the Word of God, and I'm like, what did I just read? You know, it's happened to a lot of us. But every now and then, when that Word comes, the Bible says the Holy Ghost will bring all things to remembrance. And sometimes if you just put it in there, it'll come back later, you know. I've had someone ask me, they said, do you remember what you ate last week? I said, no. Did it help you? Yeah, it did. <laughs> sometimes that's what the Word of God is. Sometimes that's what prayer is. Sometimes that's just living for God. Is you don't remember what it did to help you, but you know it did because here I am right now. Sometimes the victory is simply that you're still here. If you can just maintain sometimes, that's what the, and that's what I want to point out is that's what the Israelites were doing here is they were just maintaining. But they were winning because they were maintaining. You see, sometimes the victory is not simply... Did I mess something up here? Testing. Hello? There we go. All right. Uh, sometimes the victory is not by miles. Sometimes it's by inches. Sometimes it's just by holding your ground. One of the mighty men of valor in David's army... He was noted just for defending a bean patch, just a little small place of vegetation. Sometimes you've got to fight for what you've already got. 
I want to encourage someone tonight. If you feel like this, this you're just kind of maintained, if you're just kind of stuck in this holding pattern that I pray the same prayers every day, I never feel God, I read the same thing, I don't know what I'm talking about, I don't know what I'm listening to, just the fact that you're still here is victory. Just the fact that you still pray every day is victory. Don't stop. Paul and Silas, they were stuck in stocks. They weren't making any headway anywhere. All they had was maybe some hymn they learned in, in tabernacle years ago or Sunday tabernacle, whatever they did back then as kids. But all they did is they sung that song and they praised God and they worshiped. They weren't going anywhere. They weren't gaining ground. But that brought the victory in that time of need and eventually brought their freedom. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is what God desires. I dare say that's one of the most important things in living for God is just being faithful. Bible even says, moreover, is it required in a steward that a man be found faithful. If you can conquer that mountain of faithfulness, you can conquer a lot of stuff. Sometimes coming to church, it, it don't seem like much. You're like, oh, I came to hear Pastor Andrews preaching. You're being faithful and God's going to reward you. So Balak, the king at the time, he calls Balaam. Uh, and here's what I want to point out. I said all that to show you this. That Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all Israel, um, excuse me, all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. See, here's the thing. Israel didn't attack the Amorites. The Amorites attacked Israel. They were defending themselves. But Moab seen it and said, oh my gosh, look what the Israelites did. You see, here's the thing. Moab didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to go fight them. They could have let them, hey, yeah, just walk down this path here. You know, we'll charge a little bit along the way. Get on through. That's all they wanted. But no, see, they seen what victories that Israel had. Again, Israel wasn't conquering worlds and, and, and kingdoms at that point. They were simply just trying to get out from where they were. But the enemy saw it as victories. Right now, the enemy is looking at your life. See, from our perspective, we see where we failed. We see where we struggle. We see where we just crawl along the way. But the enemy's standing us somewhere else, watching us from far away, and saying, look what they did to all those trials. You didn't do nothing to those trials. You sat there and stood your ground. You conquered your little bean patch right here and defended it. But the enemy scared to death because he sees the power you have. Don't ever forsake the power of maintaining. Don't ever forsake the power of standing. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand. Stand, therefore. Gird your loins with truth. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. If you can't do anything else, I'm telling you, your victory lies in simply standing your ground. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Balak seeks a prophet of Balaam, all right? As far as I know, Balaam wasn't an Israelite, but he was a follower of God, and God spoke to him, and he was a prophet. He was an ally with Israel. Israel probably didn't even know he existed. And I find it interesting that Balak went to this guy. Because to me, if I'm going to beat someone who's bigger than me, I'm going to get someone bigger than them. But Bala, I'm sorry, Balak, I get him, Balaam, Balak, one of those two, the king, he went to Balaam and said, I want you to curse them. You see, Balaam was a follower of Jehovah. He talked with Jehovah. He had a relationship with them. Sometimes the enemy comes in where you least expect him. He comes in from friends, from brothers and sisters in the church. Let me warn you, don't be an instrument of the enemy. We've all been there before. I'm not speaking from a high mighty throne. We've all been instruments of the enemy to say something and to do something. You see, because here's what Balak said to Balaam. He said, I know what you bless is blessed, and I know what you curse 
is curse. What was it that Jesus said to his disciples? What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What you say about your brother and about your sister is going to pronounce a blessing or a curse on them. Watch what you say. Bless your brother. Bless your sister every chance you get. Lift them up. Don't speak ill. They're not even behind their back because that stuff travels. Sister Alicia talked about it, the, uh, was it two Sundays ago now, I think? Where you're driving along and somebody cut you off and you want to have a little choice word for them? Yeah, it's uh, that's tough. I, <laughs> I live in that world. You want to see uh, how low the IQ is of some people, direct traffic for about an hour. It don't end well, man. Oh, Lord. So Balak had Balaam come curse the Israelites. Balak was scared of the Israelites. You know, we always get this image that the devil's on this throne or, you know, kind of like, what was that guy for He-Man? Always sat on his throne, Skeletor or whatever his name. Yeah, he sat in there just laughing and, you know, you never seen the back of his eye sockets like that. And we think, we, that's what we imagine the devil. The devil's sitting there conniving something, throwing out curses and just, you know, just sending his hand. No, the devil and hell are scared. They're scared of you. That's why they use cowardly moves like going behind your back and getting your brother or sister to say something bad against you, to hurt your feelings. Yes, we've got to understand, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. When someone says something bad to you that hurts your feeling, you've got to think about it. Okay, hold on a second. Did, first of all, did they mean it that way? Or am I just in that mood that I took it that way first? Don't jump to conclusions and get offended. Hell is terrified of you. Balak was scared because they were winning. And it blows my mind because that was his perception of what the Israelites were doing. He thought that they were winning. He thought that they were out to just take over the whole country. No, they were just trying to find somewhere they could get some water. They were just trying to find somewhere they could find some provision and just exist. I dare say they all knew that, hey, we're not going to make it out of here. There might have been some uh, rumors floating around that, hey, guys, this is where we're going to see our last days is out in this wilderness. And they're just trudging along. But God was so merciful to them. He was so merciful to them to continue to bless them and to continue to give them victories. Balak goes to Balaam. And he sends some of his uh, top brass to go out and talk to him and says, Hey, I want you to come with me and I want you to curse his people. And Balaam tells him, he goes, I'll, Let me go talk to God first and I'll be right back with you. You know, I wonder how many times we do that. Hey, before I go do this, let me, let me go talk to God real quick. I bet you that'd solve a lot of our problems, wouldn't it? <laughs> so Balaam goes and he talks to God and God says, Don't go with him. And so Balaam goes back and he tells the, uh, the brass, he goes, nope, I can't go with you. And um, they said, come on, we'll give you all this money. We'll give you all this stuff. He goes, if you give me all the silver, I can't go with you. God said, no. And, of course, they continued and continued. And finally, God told him, he said, go ahead. And then on the way there is when he had the incident with the donkey. And he almost killed the donkey. And the angel almost killed him. And then the angel talked, or the donkey talked to him. And we all know that I'm not skipping over that you know, or I'm just not going to spend a lot of time on it. I, I, I'm skipping over, but I'm not going to spend time on it because that's not for my message right now. So, But finally, Balaam goes with Balak, and Balak takes him up to a couple places. And he says, I want you to curse these people. And while Balaam was talking to the angel with the donkey, the angel told him, he said, you're going to only speak what God puts in your mouth. And so Balaam said, all right, I got you. Got the message. So they go up to these places, and Balak takes them to three different spots. And the first place he took them was to a high place of Baal. And it says from that Balaam went out, he, he said, all right, bring some sacrifices. And Balak brought some sacrifice. They sacrificed, and then Balaam went up to the rock. And he looks out over them, and God says, say this. And Balaam goes, from, for from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned with 
among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last ends be like his. He's saying that Israel, they're going to be alone. They're going to be a sovereign nation. They're not going to be under the thumb of anyone else. They shall not be reckoned with. No one's going to mess with these guys. These are some bad people. Who can count the, the dust of Jacob? It's going to be, they're going to be numerous. And he even goes as far as to says, let me die the death that they get. Now let me remind you, these are the people that God just wanted to kill. We do some pretty stupid stuff sometimes. We mess up a whole bunch, but God is merciful. God is merciful that even when the enemy, see, this is what I love. You ever been in a fight with your sibling? And you want to just wring their neck? But then someone else comes and starts messing with them? And then it's the game on against this person. That's how God, God, it's a family. But don't mess with God's people. That's the word that God has for the enemy. Don't mess with my people. Yeah, they mess up a lot. They got a lot of faults. Sometimes I just want to snuff them out. But they're mine, and I love them. The Bible says that you are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, chosen generation. Now, I'm here to tell you, anyone that battles with guilt, that's nothing to be worried about. Once you repent of your sins, it's out, it's out of God's vision. It's under the blood. God has forgiven you. Don't sit there and, and beat yourself up over and over and over again for something that you've done. Because God's seen it. God knew about it. That's the crazy thing. God knew about it before you did it, and he still chose to die for you on the cross. That blows my mind. God knows exactly what I was going to do, and he still didn't exclude me from the blood sacrifice on Calvary. God loves you so much that it doesn't matter how low you've sunk. It doesn't matter how much you stink. God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins if you just ask him. <laughs> Glory to God. So Balaam, he says, I can't do it. And Balak says, what are you doing, man? I told you to curse him. So Balak takes him to a different spot. He takes him to the field of Zophim. All right, first time was from a high place, and now it's from a field. And he tells him to curse him. And so Balaam does the same thing. But instead of cursing, he says, He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Now, I know you all thinking about my little pony. Right? That's not the unicorn he's talking about. We actually did a, a little, I'll say a little study on unicorns in the Bible. And really all a unicorn is, it's a single-horned rhinoceros. The ones we got today are called bicornus because they got the big horn and then the little one. But they had these ancient rhinoceros that only had the one horn, hence the una and the unicorn. So he is declaring that Israel is as strong as one of these rhinoceroses. Rhinoceros eye, there we go. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. He's saying that they're going to be victorious. These people are strong. These people are able to, uh, to fight the battle and to overcome. These are the people that God just wanted to snuff out. It blows my mind how merciful God is. Finally, he took them to another part, to the top of Peor. And Balaam again, instead of cursing, he blesses. And he says, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are, they spread forth as gardens by the river's side. As the trees of line, aloes which are the Lord's, which the, excuse me, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. <clears throat> he shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. 
He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion. Who shall stir him? Who's going to make this guy upset? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that cursed thee. He again declares their strength and how they're going to be innumerable. He tells how they're going to break the bones of their enemies and pierce them through with arrows and conquer them. He calls Israel a great lion and says no one can stir them up. You ever seen those big lions out there and the birds land on them? Or the little cubs pull their ears? Nothing mess with them. Because if you, if you got to walk in the room and tell everybody you're the baddest man in the room, you ain't the baddest man in the room. You see, and this is already being accomplished. You see, this blessing wasn't something from the future. It was happening now. Israel didn't have to say a word. And the enemy already knew. These are some bad man pajamas. We don't want to tangle with these guys. Let's try to weaken them first. But here's the thing. Here's what the devil tries to do. He took Balaam to three different locations. Look at these people from this side. At one point, Balak even said, just look at the outskirts right here, this, this fringe people right here. I, I take it the, the popular people didn't hang out on the outside. That was probably the weird people. Look at these guys. These guys don't deserve to be blessed. You need to curse them. I don't know how they want all this already. Maybe it's because of that guy right there, but they don't need to be you know, people dwelling in our land anymore. You need to curse them. And every time Balaam looked at the people, he said, I can't. God has blessed them. He took them over here. Look at these guys. Look at their weakness over here. Look what these guys can't do. Look how many times this guy's messed up. He's got a problem with going places on the computer. He shouldn't. This guy's got a problem with substance. This guy can't put the bottle down. Do you think these are people that need it? And God still says they're blessed. They're mine. I love them. I don't care what they've done. I, this is God, it's amazing to me because God was ready to start over fresh with a brand new set of people. But he loved them so much. He said, I don't care how they look. I don't care what they've done. I don't care who they are, what they become. I love them and I'm going to bless them. And they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna multiply and they're going to become stronger. Again, all this is happening without Israel's knowledge. Think about how many battles are being won right now or fought and you don't know about. Sometimes you'll feel the effects of them and you don't know what's going on. Sometimes you just feel a certain heaviness about you and you don't know what's going on. That's battles being fought in the background. Stuff that you never even have to touch. Israel was familiar with this. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. They didn't have to do a thing. All they had to do was walk, and God split the Red Sea so they could get through on dry land. There are battles being fought for you right now that you never know. God is setting up stuff that you don't know about. This is why I brought out the point of complaining. Sometimes things happen in your life, and you just you don't know why this. Why did this happen? Where did this come from? I didn't do anything to deserve this. And God's setting something up. There was a great country. And it ruled over many other smaller cities. It had great wealth and it was a superpower of that day. It had more than enough resources. And in fact, it was projected to have almost a decade of profound growth that would have been unlike anything else anyone had ever seen up until that point. However, there was a dark shadow over the country as well. A time of depression and famine that was going to hit the land. And in fact, this famine would be so great that it would wipe out any memory of the good times before. You see, God promised Abraham that his seed would be like the sand on the beaches. And if this country would have went down, Abraham's seed probably would have disappeared with the two because you see, they were in that region of Egypt as well. So God made a plan. He said, I'm going to put a godly man, a God-fearing man on the throne in Egypt. Not on the throne, but in a position of power. One of the thrones over there. And he said, I'm going to put a man over there that fears me. And he's going to listen to what I say. But here's the problem. I don't have a man in Egypt right now. i got to get him there. Enter Joseph. 
Joseph, all he seen was, my brothers just betrayed me. They threw me in a pit and sold me to slave owners. They tore up my robe and put blood on it made my dad believe that I'm dead. And he gets to Egypt and he's a slave. And he actually works hard and gets to a position of authority in Potiphar's house and only to be lied on by Potiphar's wife and thrown back into jail. And he again worked himself up. Good behavior, you want to call it. And got himself in another kind of a place of authority. And he was able to tell dreams of a baker and of a cupbearer to the king. And he was given the promise by one of these servants that, hey, when I get out, I'll remember you. But he forgot about him. And all Joseph sees is I, I get set up and I get thrown down. I get put up and I get put down. But God had a plan in all of this. He said, I'm going to use Joseph to save an entire world at that time. Because if I can't get Joseph here, and if he doesn't go through all this, then he won't get up to the place of authority to enact all these laws and, and, and organize all this stuff so that the whole nation can be saved and so that Abraham's seed can be preserved. Things are going on in your life right now that you don't understand. Don't complain. Don't worry about it. God said, or the word of God says that, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to sit there and just kind of uh, like skate through it and there'll be no more worries and no more. No, but the Bible gives a formula for what to do. All right, it says, be careful for nothing, first of all. All right, don't worry about anything. All right, that's hard to do, but don't do it, okay? But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart mind. So here's the formula. First of all, pray about it. Supplicate, cry your eyes out. All right. Intercede, do what you got to do. Cry, boo-hoo, snot, get the rag, clean yourself up. But when you're done, start praising God. Start thanking God. Because it's at that point, once you get to the end of that, that the peace of God that passes all understanding now covers your mind and heart. Musicians, if you'd like to come. Y'all would stand. I'm about to close. God has a plan in everything that we go through. And a lot of times we won't even know what we just went through and what the plan was. I mean, you think, I mean, we're, a lot of us are, are, are well off. I dare say everyone in this room are well off. And if you think you are, there's always someone's worse off than you. But if you were to sit here and think about the things that got me to where I am, it'd probably blow your mind. You wouldn't be able to do it. Because we don't see all the things that God has organized behind the scenes. But the biggest thing, and this is, I've, I've, I've said everything. I know I was kind of all over the place. But I said all that to say this. God wants to give his people peace. Peace in whatever's going on. And you say, well, I want that too. A lot of people, they refuse it. That's crazy. Isaiah says, we all know this scripture, but we cut it off a lot of times. It says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. And that's where we end it. But the very next line says, yet they would not hear. God is offering peace to someone out here, but we won't hear it. Why? Well, because we think we have a plan. And we think that if we worry enough and if we toil enough, then we'll make it to come to pass anyways. That was Abraham's problem. God gave him a promise. And he said, I'm going to help God along. And he ended up having Ishmael. And now today, they're the two biggest family rivalries in the Middle East. 
because somebody thought that they could help God's plan. God's got a plan. You can't make it better. I don't care how hard you try, you can't make it better. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for the good to them who love God, who are called according to His purpose. When you go to a hotel, you don't sit there and worry about, is the employees going to show up? Is there going to be food? Is someone going to turn down my sheets? Are they going to leave the little mint on my pillow? You don't. And especially if it's a real nice hotel, you just go and you relax because there's already a plan in place. That's all God wants you to do. Now, I'm not saying you stick your head in the sand like an ostrich. But rest in knowing that God has a plan and He has it all worked out. I was praying the other day and I started quoting that scripture. It's a song too. and It's, it's in Isaiah. It talks about peace like a river. And so I said, Lord, I thank you for peace like a river. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Why is a river considered peaceful? And a lot of times we think about it, we think about the lazy river. You know, turtles flying across, trout jumping up, someone on a raft sipping lemonade. And that's part of a river. But rivers turn into rapids. Rapids turn into waterfalls. And it gets pretty rough. We had a uh, brother from our church years ago. They went on a men's white water rafting thing. And he ended up breaking his leg. That wasn't peaceful. <laughs> they had a... He was a big man, too. They had to carry him for a while. He's a big one. But that wasn't peaceful. So why, why does Isaiah say peace like a river? And God spoke to me this. He said, because a river knows where it's going. Or rather, it doesn't know it's going, but it knows to trust the path that's already carved out for it. The river knows I don't have to sit here and worry about, am I going to have enough steam to get down river? No. River doesn't have to worry about, am I going to have enough water to make it to the end? It knows. My path's already carved out for me. God has already written your story. Trust Him. Trust that God is going to take you through the end. The Bible said God knows how to keep that which has been committed to Him. He's able to preserve you to the end. I feel like somebody, and God put it on my heart, and it's been on my heart all week. That somebody is worried about their loved one, a lost loved one, and they can't get peace. I, I understand that you're worried that, you know, that they're not in church. They're, they, they're not living for God. They were at one point, but they're not now. And I just, I don't know what to do. And I, and I understand the worry there. I understand the heartburn every night. But I feel like God wanted me to preach this message to tell you. He wants to give you peace. Worry and, and anxiety is not part of God's prayer plan. It's actually the opposite. God wants to give you peace like a river. God's already been before you. He knows exactly where you're going. All you got to do is ride the rapid. That's all you got to do. If someone needs peace, I want to invite you to these altars right now. If somebody's going through something that they need God to touch their life and to give peace, if you're worried about something, something's keeping you up, please come up here to this altar. Let us pray for you. The enemy attacks when he's scared. That's a good indication you're doing something good. Are you going through a trial? That's a good sign. That's not bad. It might hurt. But that means the devil's scared. That means the enemy's worried about you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord. His face upon you and the thousands of generations. Your family and your children, their children, their children. Be upon